I am really excited to introduce our this next topic and our rock star panel. But before I get to introducing our guests and jump into the debates, let's talk just a little bit about the topic, stable coins versus central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. Uh, I think we can start with a few areas of alignment that I see across government and the private sector. First, we're moving to a cashless world. And to get there, we need some version of digital assets. Second, moving to digital can and should increase financial inclusion. Third, moving to digital should improve, not erode, privacy, while balancing the need for governments to have access to the information they need to protect the public from the broad, and the broader financial system from instability, fraud, abuse, other harms. And finally, going to digital should reduce friction in executing transactions and payments. The debate comes in answering the question, what is the best way to achieve those goals? Through digital assets issued by private banks, private companies, and or central banks. Private sector is the first mover in this space as evidenced by the wide array of stable coins in the market today. Stablecoin arrangements take a variety of approaches to achieving the stable aspect of their value from fully fiat backed to synthetic or algorithmic. And despite the prevalence of stable coins, there's a lack of clarity and consistency in how regulators across the globe are viewing them. Are they assets, securities, money market funds, e-money or something else? On the other hand, per the Atlantic Council, 87 countries are engaged in some level of research, development, or deployment of a CBDC. And there are variations in CBDC models as well. For example, account-based or a two-tiered system, a retail CBDC, or a wholesale CBDC. But at their core, CBDCs are touted as minimizing the risks that we see uh, that folks are, are, are claiming with uh, respect to stable coins because like fiat, they'd be backed directly by the Federal Reserve. But does the issuance of a digital asset by the central bank mean a trade-off with respect to privacy? Will CBDCs create the same type of friction that we see in the traditional financial system with respect to cross-border transactions? Or do they present opportunities with respect to better interoperability? And can central banks keep up with the innovation that this space demands? Luckily, we have some leading experts here who will touch on many, if not all, of these topics as they respond to a few debate prompts that we've created. Now, you're going to see the prompts up on the screen as statements, and please know that these were drafted with an eye towards getting a conversation started, not because SDF or anyone necessarily on this panel endorses any of the views expressed. So with that kind of stage setting, let's jump into introductions. So today we have Alex McDougall from Stable Corp and Dante Desparte from Circle, who will share their opinions from the perspective of two different approaches to fiat-backed stable coins. So I'm gonna ask for quick intros so we can get to the meat of the program, but we'll start with you, Alex. Fantastic, thanks so much for hosting. Excellent programming uh, already today and really excited to dive into this. I'm Alex McDougall, President and CEO of Stable Canada Stable Corp. Uh, we are issuing a bank-issued stablecoin called VCAD um, upcoming in, in Q1, which is actually a digital deposit receipt, so adding a new wrinkle into the, the public versus private um, discussion. So really, really interested to, to work with my, my colleagues today to flesh out some of these issues and, uh, and dig a little bit deeper. Going to be fun. Great. Thank you so much for being here. And we will move on to Dante, who is at Circle. Hi, Candice. Uh, really an honor being with you today and, and looking forward to the discussion. Um, so I am uh, Circle's Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Global Policy. And for those who may not know, Circle is to banking and payments what a Tesla is to the internal combustion engine. We're trying to modernize a lot of the core infrastructure around how money moves, including being the issuer of USDC, a dollar digital currency um, that enjoys the powers of the internet and the fundamental trust in the US dollar. Great, welcome. Um, I had not heard the Tesla um, comparison yet, but that's I'm already it's already got all sorts of thoughts in my head. Um, and then, so from the CBDC perspective, we have Josh Lipsky from the Atlantic Council, who they're the ones who bring us that great tracker of CBDCs, and Simon Chantry from Bit, who's working with uh, central banks and actually working on deploying CBDCs. So, Josh, uh, I will turn to you for a quick intro. 
Well, thank you, Candice, and thanks everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here and looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I'm Josh Lipsky. I'm the director of the Geoeconomics Center at the Council. I was previously with the IMF, and behind me is the tracker that's been referenced, our interactive CBDC tracker. And I'll just make one note to what you said, Candice. We're now up to 90 countries, uh, not 87, in pursuit of CBDC. And I'm sure we'll get into all of the different design choices they're thinking about in our conversation. Looking forward to it. Great. Thanks, Josh. I, I meant to ask you that right before because I, I know that that's a, it's that's why we're here talking about it, right? This is an ever moving uh, conversation and more and more uh, central banks and private companies are jumping into the space. Uh, so our, our final panelist is Simon Chantry from BIT. And Simon, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, hi, Candace, and a uh, pleasure to be with you today and with all the fellow panelists. Uh, I'm Simon Chantry. I'm co-founder and CIO of BIT. Um, BIT offers a full stack digital currency management system for central banks. We have some of the uh, most progressed CBDC pilot projects in the world. Uh, I should say that I, I do recognize the importance of stable coins and our offering actually does also serve stable coin deployments. Uh, one of which we're actually rolling out in Belize now with the National Bank of Belize. I do think that there's a lot of similarities in the technology stack and I hope we get into uh, to that today. Great. Yes, I think it is. Um, we, we've set this up as a debate, but as we know, there's a lot of crossover between CBDCs and, and stable coins. And so um, I hope that we've we've created prompts that will allow you to not feel like you're trapped in, in picking a position, but um, free to talk about your, your views of the of the two options. Um, and perhaps by the end, we'll talk about whether they are really options or they're just two different varieties of, of um, achieving these goals that we set out um, earlier. So um, prompt the first debate, we're gonna get into it. We'll turn to Simon and then Alex. And as you can see, we have a timer running and I'm going to ask you to limit your initial responses to this prompt to two minutes each. I'll try and like jump in and, and stop you if I must. Um, and then you'll each get about a minute to respond to the other. And um, so with that, the first topic, according to a recent McKinsey report, Collectively, nearly $3 trillion in stable coins such as Tether and USDC were transacted in the first half of 2021. Given the prevalence of stable coins, should governments let the private sector continue to lead the way on the development and deployment of these digital assets? And then governments can focus their attention on crafting appropriate regulations to bring certainty and protections to this space instead of trying to recreate the wheel by creating their own stable coins in the form of a CBDC. So some of you have, may have small screens. I'll read the, the actual prompt is, innovation is best left to the private sector. So I will start with you, Simon. Thanks, Candace, happy to kick us off. Uh, so, so look, I do think that the growth in stablecoin market cap and transaction volume is impressive and, and definitely significant. Um, I would argue that uh, the innovation both on the CBDC side and the stablecoin side has been driven by the private sector. And uh, I can tell you that firsthand that for years we were knocking on central banks doors saying this is an inevitability. You will need to upgrade the technology behind your currencies. And what's funny is that before uh, sort of before July 2019, and those of you who watch the you know this space closely will know that that was the when the Facebook uh, or sorry when Libra launched their white paper. Uh, prior to that point, central banks didn't pay as much attention, and immediately after that point is when we actually they actually started paying more attention. And I think. Um, uh, so I would argue that, again, innovation has been happening in the private sector and it's happening on both sides. It's happening on stablecoin sides and it's happening, happening on uh, vendors like BIT who service financial institutions and service central banks. Uh, again, I would say it's an inevitability that both are going to exist. I do think that these are just iterations of payment tools and value transfer tools that are brought about because of the internet. I still, I always come back to the fact that the internet itself is evolving and changing industries in many different ways. And this is just another one that the internet is changing. So I think we're going to continue to see 
um, innovation on both fronts. Uh, and I do think that there's a lot of crossover. As I mentioned, BITS digital currency management system, it suits central banks and it suits uh, financial institutions. There's a lot of similarities in running a stablecoin deployment and running a CBDC deployment. Now, where our feature set gets augmented is when you're talking about the implementation and the adjustment of monetary policy in real time. That's where obviously we specialize for central banks. Um, but I'll, I'll pause there. I don't want to oh, take uh, too much timing. time. timing. You're watching the go. clock. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> um, all right. So, Alex. That was fantastic. Um, no, I, I think there's there's absolutely innovation that happens at, at both layers, but I think it's a very different type of innovation. I mean, we've, we've organized our, our private sector structure to be dollar value maximizing. Now, that's the way we've organized our corporate structure. That's the way we've organized our governance. That's the way we, we, we've created private institutions. And that leads to a certain type of innovation that's very powerful, very explosive, and very oriented around a commercial space and a commercial mindset. And you know, the, the point of our public sector is sort of to fill in the gaps and, and maximize for collective well-being and, and maximize for these, you know, these collective action problems. Um, and where the private sector gets weird or it breaks or it you know, does things that are objectively uh, against the, um, you know, the, the broader well-being of, a, of, a, of an organization or a country. Um, but that's that's a lot harder to to maximize for. What what are we maximizing for from a public sector perspective? Is it happiness, GDP? Is it wealth? It, it's a much squishier problem. And so when we think about where innovation happens at the private sector, it's it's um, it's very it can be very powerful and very explosive and very fast. On the public sector side, it needs to be these bigger kind of issues, and it needs to be more around models and governance structures and things that are less able to be solved immediately with technology. Um, so when we're looking at how we sort of replumb the infrastructure and how we kind of redo the infrastructure of our, of our payments and, um, and our, uh, our financial system, it, it's a bit of a mix of the two. It needs to be driven from a tech perspective. And I think this, this builds on what Simon was saying of even the models that we're using to work with our, our public sector are driven from this private sector uh, mentality of innovation. But there's a huge onus on the public sector to manage that properly and figure out where those breaks in collective action are and innovate on the governance structures that oversee that. And as the private sector tech gets better and better and better, it becomes harder and harder and harder to do. So I don't think it's technology innovation that needs to be um, prioritized at the, at the public sector level. It's model innovation, it's governance innovation, and leave the, the technology innovation to the private sector, which is, which is generally the driver of it. All right, Simon, we'll give you a few minutes, um, a minute or a little less than a minute now, but a minute or so to respond. Well, look, I think Alex, your comments are super timely, especially because the BIS just released a new paper or an iteration of the paper today on governance and with distributed ledger technology, governance of money with distributed ledger technology, which really I'm not through all the way yet. So I am uh, looking forward to seeing their thoughts on that. But I agree, Go governance and policy surrounding these will be a real challenge. Uh, but I think we're seeing progress on that, especially with the president's working group um, paper and whatnot, which I should commend uh, Stellar for their uh, contributions on that as well. Um, so I, yeah, I do think, uh, I, I recognize what you're saying that technology innovation is certainly happening at the private sector and it always does. It always pushes at the private sector, but, uh, Candace, sorry if it's a little boring, but I just, ag I agree with the, <laughs> the I know, I know. Well, that's what I know. That's, as I said at the outset, I think that there is, there is a lot of, there's a lot of, um, it, it's not necessarily a, a black and white uh, question, which is why it's good for discussion. So, uh, Alex, we'll give you the last 30 sure. seconds. Yeah, and I just want to build on the uh, the BIS angle. Um, you know, I, I have some quibbles with their their micro um, uh, approach to to digital assets, but but overall, I've found they've done a good job of putting putting some level of black and whiteness around um, quantifying what is like the old world and what is new, and really sort of drilling in on what is new and, and trying to put some guardrails around that. And, and I thought they, you know, their their way of approaching stable coins. Or stable assets in in their uh, their previous report was was prescient of well, okay what's the underlying and then what is the tether or the new thing that's being created on top of it and let's really focus in on that new piece and that's you know that's to me is is a good way of sort of um, productively separating the two um, allow the private sector again to to really kind of build the the tech that underlies it and and focus with with BIS and organizations like that on understanding what's new and trying to put guardrails and models around it. 
Yeah, I think to me, this feels like an area where we really, really need to push on that public private um, partnership and, and figure out like, how do we not re redo what we've done in the past, which is the private sector, the innovators and the public sector are slow and behind, like, let's figure it out. This is the, this is the place to, to really figure out how to work together and get, get to the right place for the, for the people. Um, and uh, so uh, really interesting to hear your perspectives and, I'm going to keep on schedule here and I'm going to move on to the next uh, the next topic. And this one, we're going to start with Dante and then Simon, you get the, you get the last word on this one. Uh, give everyone a chance to be first and second. Um, so, again, two minutes each, roughly, uh, and, uh, and then about a minute to respond. So uh, the topic. As anyone who has any involvement with Stellar, the Stellar ecosystem knows, we are all in on the power of blockchain technology to improve access to the financial system. It's encouraging to see how consistently this goal appears in the CBDC discussion coming directly from policymakers and central banks. So for the purposes of this topic, let's assume that financial inclusion is paramount. What is the best way to achieve that through CBDCs or stablecoins or both? So again, for those with small screens, the prompt is central banks are better equipped to address financial inclusion. Dante? Oh, great. Thank you, Candice. So I would not want to stand on a panel, let alone a debate with such intellectual juggernauts unless I came prepared to win. Um, and so at first, I must apologize as one of the people who was one of the founders of the Libra Project. My apology is that it probably more so than any other initiative galvanized the world's central banks to try to pick a technology stack and compete in this space. However, the operating model, as much as the scorecard of public sector digital transformation and public sectors picking winners and losers, is very checkered, it's very bad, and I think we should be very, very watchful, and I'm glad there is such a tool as the Atlantic Council's CBDC tracker, and in my view, a watch list of where the potential of unchecked public sector innovation and disruption, looking at the two-tiered banking systems, payment systems innovations, is likely to emerge as a risk a risk that will erode privacy, a risk that will erode uh, the, the ability to have a censorship resistant form of money, and ultimately a, ri a risk that will not advance financial inclusion priorities. As you know very well from not only my work, my advocacy, but also what CIRCLE stands for. We absolutely believe that you could raise economic prosperity for billions of people around the world, but you cannot do it if the only operating model for banking and payments is enshrined in brick and mortar. And the central banks of the world, as many of the global institutions around the world, um, have had a monopoly on solving for financial inclusion for hundreds of years, right? And yet the scorecard until very recently has remained checkered. We have 1.7 billion people around the world who have no access to the banking system, yet a billion of them have an access to a low cost internet connected mobile device. My premise is very simple. Until we all collectively, every single one of us who has a shot at bending the arc of Moore's law in the favor of humanity, such that every one of those internet connected mobile devices becomes a part of a payment, a compliant payment endpoint, we should not cease. Now, the form factor that the money takes in its digital form, a central bank digital currency is a domestic payments innovation to the extent it is even deployed. And I think there too, it poses enormous complexities and enormous risks. But to the extent that form factor of money can exist in the way that USDC does, which is a dollar imported onto the internet and inheriting the internet powers, it then becomes a cross-border payment instrument. It could address remittances, which are a bigger cash flow than foreign direct investment and official government development aid. Um, and it could start to pull billions of people into lower cost payments, cross-border payments, domestic payments, and so on. This innovation is not an abstraction like CBDCs. It's real. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna... to... Move it over uh, to uh, give Simon a chance to respond. Okay, that wow, I, very very well said, Dante. And uh, and again, I agree with a lot of your points. Um, I, I'll sort of harken back to one of my initial comments, which I, I I I believe that central banks, as you correctly pointed out, are in a tight spot and feel the need to innovate. Now, uh, given the classification that central bank money takes on itself, it is the most risk free form of money. Uh, in a financial system, given that it doesn't bear uh, institutional like uh, deposit risk. Um, I, I, I Again, I think it's a natural evolution of central bank money that it will uh, be extended to households and individuals. I think um, the, the reason it hasn't been extended uh, past notes and coins thus far is, is more so the result of a growing, uh, growing 
national economies, and now that we're faced with globalization and tech and rapid technological innovation, you see that that forcing central banks to recognize that they need their uh, their own in-depth technology strategy to evolve their own currency. And so I, I think the same arguments that you made for uh, stable coins offering beneficial features and access to all kinds of different pockets of society, I think the same can be applied to CBDCs. Now, I'm also concerned of, about privacy uh, and accountability for the operators of these systems, absolutely. Um, and it's something that I think uh, the standards work can, can be accelerated greatly and should be accelerated greatly, especially in the US. Um, I wrote a piece last week that was uh, kind of like a call to action that we're looking for, uh, and I believe the world is looking for the, the financial leader of the world, which is the US, uh, to step up and establish standards for accountability, transparency, for privacy protection for all who touch CBDCs. So that's definitely close to uh, close to my heart and close to uh, the work that we're doing at Bit. Fascinated with the technology solutions that are coming out that will protect against privacy. But again, I think they can be applied to both stable coins or CBDCs. Dante. So Any one of the sponsor? challenges broadly, one of the big challenges that I have about a lot of the arguments against stable coins and the arguments in favor of CBDC is that we're all concerned about consumer protection so much so that we would rather keep billions of people on the margins of low cost payments and financial services, assuming that we as individual actors do are not sufficiently enlightened as to what the buyer should be, where we should have buyer beware disclosures. And so we're trying to create not only did we go through a short-term stablecoin purity war about what were the prudential assets backing stablecoins, but we're also now trying to effectively have many of the world's central banks um, compete with their very banking systems and their very private sector innovators. When in reality, the air gap between the central bank where you wanna have monetary policy preserved and the banking system is, an, is a feature, it's not a bug, right? Most value added money in circulation today, 95% of it is in fact riding on private rails banks that it, that have leverage and banks that you know follow a fractional reserve model are effectively creating money. We just happen to be doing that in a, in a form factor that imports money onto the internet. And I think it's the, it's, it gives us the highest prospects of extending the dollar and other trusted currencies around the world uh, for an always on global economy. Our financial needs don't take bank holidays, but the banking system does. I have very little confidence that a central bank digital currency will ever meet any of these issues domestically, let alone in a cross-border setting. All right, last 20 some seconds, Simon. <laughs> I guess all I would say is that they will need to if they're going to be competitive, right? They will need to meet those requirements. They'll need to be 24 seven. They'll need to be interoperable with other CBDCs or firms like Bit haven't done our job correctly, right? And so I think that will be the evolutionary path that we see uh, for the technology and the deployment structure of CBDCs in, in the coming years. Yeah, I think um, both of these topics have sort of highlighted this uh, this role of government. And, uh, and I think the the pace of the CBDC process versus the private sector, which always moves more quickly. Um, there's obviously always this question of, is there a role even before CBDCs are issued for the, for the central banks and the governments to set some standards, uh, even if they haven't even decided whether they're gonna do, uh, go forward with their own CBDC. So, um, all right, gosh, we really need more time for all this. Um, Next topic, this one is for Alex and then Josh and same time limit supply. Um, so another critical issue is privacy, which has already come up. Uh, moving from cash to digital meaning, means creating a digital record of transactions. On open public blockchains, these records are immutable and transparent. We all know that privacy standards and expectations vary widely from country to country. Uh, presumably, a central bank will apply their own privacy standards to their CBDCs, and they'll need to incorporate the government's need for transparency. Moreover, many central banks are looking at the programmability of CBDCs as a means to, of dictating how and for what a CBDC can be used. So does the very notion of a central bank issuing and controlling these digital assets move the needle on privacy in the wrong direction? And does it create unnecessary hurdles with respect to interoperability uh, from country to country? So that's a lot in one, but CBDCs move the privacy needle in the wrong direction. Alex? I think given, and I'll go back to my innovation uh, at different layers um, comment before, I think without innovation at the public sector layer level, it absolutely does. I mean, we, we, we've created structures within our public sector right now and, and within our, you know, our, our highly regulated financial institutions as well, where 
They're basically asking for maximum transparency that's possible. And there's a limit on what's possible in our current financial system with cash, with bank records, with the transactability. And we, you know, we don't have a great fundamental infrastructure of our banking. And that's both a feature from a you know, privacy perspective and a bug from a, a transparency and an AML perspective. When you replumb all of that with a completely auditable, infinitely storable and infinitely viewable Batman machine, for lack of a better term, um, you know, that's, that's terrifying with our current institutional mindset of more, 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 more. And our public sectors do have uh, not a great record with, um, with, with, uh, with privacy. And, and some of that, so without the innovation in the actual models, and some of that can be technology driven. I mean, the blockchain industry has done wonderful work around um, you know, managed privacy. So zero knowledge proofs, zero knowledge data, um, a, a lot of those pieces. So should we be solving the, you know, the, the privacy gap that's created by more technology with even more technology? Maybe. Can we solve it with better models of how we're looking for and what we're really looking for? Probably a better scalable solution. So yes, it absolutely does move the needle in the wrong direction, unless we can create better models for how we're actually governing these things. On the flip side of that, it creates an incredible um, opportunity for complete universal machine speed knowledge about what's happening and where flows are. The amount of information that comes with a fully blockchain financial system is exponential multiples of what we have today. So great opportunity, but also terrifying with our current governance. All right, Josh, finally, you get to speak. I know you wanted to chime in on all these things, but go ahead. It's, it's been difficult to wait. Okay, I've been here, watching. Here, I'll, ju <laughs> I'll jump in. Let me debunk some myths that I think I heard today and or talked broadly about CBDCs, and then I'll answer the privacy question. First of all, central bank digital currencies are happening. 90 countries around the world are exploring central bank digital currencies. It is not an either or choice between central bank digital currencies and stable coins. These things can and should coexist. And to the extent countries are exploring pilot projects, the 16 countries that have pilots, they do it in coordination with stablecoin deployment and cryptocurrencies within their own economies. They do not disintermediate the banking system. Every country that's deployed a CBDC does it in a two-tiered model through the traditional banking system, including China. And speaking of China, the boogeyman in the room that often gets touted out to say, oh, but China, look what they're doing. There are 89 other countries and models to think about when it comes to CBDC. China gets way too much airtime, in my opinion. And that brings us to the privacy issue, which is the focus of this topic. Yes, CBDCs can produce privacy risks. So can other technology companies. I think we've seen that recently. There are privacy risks with any kind of digital payments that have to be well-regulated, that have to have oversight. But it's about design choices. It's about how you build the CBDC. And I think the mistake that's made is for people to come and say, oh, this could be abused, so we shouldn't even try it. That's wrong. This could be designed correctly. It could be designed wrong, but we need to look at the models like the Riksbank now in Sweden that are looking at privacy, where they have tiered wallet systems, anonymity below a certain level. These are good models to follow. And Candace, finally, to your point, you talked about the US and standard setting. Yes, completely agree. Because in the absence of the US putting something on the table to address these legitimate privacy concerns, China's model will proliferate. There are cross-border testing right now with China. And so that's the challenge. Don't back away from the playing field. It's not about CBDC dominance over everything. It's about CBDC complementary in the digital ecosystem. All right, Alex. Yep. Uh, no, well, well, well said, mm -hmm. Josh. Um, I appreciate your, your points on there. And, and I think it's, it's, it's a similar view to mine of, of designing the right structures and designing the right governance and then allowing the tech to be machine speed within those, uh, within those parameters. Um, I, I feel like I have a little bit less faith that the, the, there will be a voluntary seeding of um, control, for lack of a better term, and, and a material change in, in the way that we've kind of moved our privacy needle existing from the public sector, which has been you know, a gradual and well, not that gradual erosion of, uh, of individual standards. Um, but I remain eternally optimistic, and, and I think that there's What's really cool about the blockchain space is that you can hard code black and white in you know, machine logic what the privacy standards are, where right now we're sort of relying on a bunch of loopholes and a bunch of um, lack of clarity around where what, what the rules really are. And I think you know, it, um, uh, regimes really drive trucks through those lack of clarity. Whereas in a blockchain world, if you agree on it once and you code it into the standard, then privacy is guaranteed. 
Um, and so there is hope for it, but we need to have the, the right people, the right drive, the right force, the right governance structures and the right execution mechanisms. And I very much hope that the Atlantic Council is driving that forward. And Josh, I'll give you the last 30 yeah. some seconds. We, we are trying and along with a lot of other partners, some on this call. So I, I totally agree with what you said. We have to prove it. Countries have to prove that they can do it and they will have to compete with private sector options. The only thing I would say is don't let the legitimate privacy concerns make you not even attempt to do it. And there are enormous benefits for a CBDC that I believe a stable coin itself could not provide. And I just give the example of stimulus, of taxes. There are some core government functions that I think a central bank like the Federal Reserve or the ECB will Will want to retain for themselves and their finance ministries. And we should not leave that amazing technology on the table that could help people because of the design concerns that I think can be solved, but have to be proved that they can be solved. Great. All right. Well, I have lots of thoughts, but we have to keep moving on to our next topic. And this one is for Josh and then Dante. Uh, so in the United States, the president's working group, which we mentioned earlier, or, or the PWG, recently released a report on stable coins. And they did not seem to think that stable coins need to be squelched or replaced with CBDCs, but they did recommend that only federally insured depository institutions be allowed to issue the tokens. And they cited a whole host of concerns and risks, like runs on the runs on the market, and um, you know I, I won't get into all of them. Um, I think many of us have read the report. Um, so the question is, are only banks, central banks, or or um, private banks? the ones who can be trusted to issue coins safely. So we'll start with you this time, Josh. Sure, and here's one where we'll see, Dante and I may not disagree as much as we think. I think we have to get out of this mode of thinking about you know, what is a traditional bank? That's an old way of thinking about the system. And to the extent the presidential working group had maybe an overly narrow definition of what is a bank and what is a private service provider and a financial payment provider, that's not the right way to think about it. I think there are other institutions that can provide stable coins, can provide dollar backed assets that aren't traditional banks in the way we think about it. They have to be well regulated, there has to be oversight, uh, but it doesn't have to be just the traditional banking system in that way of thinking about it, because I think that gets to the core issue of what many people on this call have been saying, which is don't let don't crowd out innovation in this space. And so, you know, this idea of a bank, we have this old brick and mortar model that Dante talked about. That's not where the global economy is heading. That's not where digital payments are heading. And so it's overly restrictive to say that. But what it really means is that you need stability, you need liquidity. I know this is something Circle focuses on and others as well. That's really what the PWG is getting at. And maybe the terminology bank, as Fed Governor Waller said today, is probably an overly restrictive way of thinking about it. But safety, stability, limiting volatility, security, preventing runs, protecting consumers. That's the way to think about it. And if other companies can do that and can be regulated and licensed and oversight, then I'm all for that. All right. You did not mention the word insurance, um, but I'm going to move it over to Dante to respond and then, and then we'll come back to you. Yeah. So nested in the president's working group's report and, and the idea that stablecoin issuers should be insured at depository institutions is a really, really important concept. And so if in fact the world is in a digital currency space race, as the Atlantic Council has been tracking with the advent of CBDCs and interest in CBDCs around the world, and as very ardent and passionate advocates like Chris Giancarlo have been describing with the digital dollar project, then the way the quote unquote West will win this digital currency space race is through a simple policy decision that has nothing to do with technology. It is to decide whether or not we can confer digital legal tender status to form factors of money that are already in circulation, like in the, Euro in the European Union, the concept of e-money or in the United States, what is today regulated as money transmission. That's a policy decision that has more to do with legality and less to do with which type of institution can be an issuer of money. Again, most money in circulation on the planet today is value added. If I came to you and came to the world with an innovation called cash by today's regulatory and financial crime compliance standards, it would not be approved because of its opacity, its lack of utility, and in the context of a public health emergency, the ability to be a vector for spreading a disease. And so some countries physically resorted to laundering their money. Now, while Circle has asserted well before the PWG issued its report, our intention of becoming a bank, the reason we want to become a bank is we actually think we import good conduct and good prudential conduct into the banking system, bearing in mind that our business model is fully reserved. 
Every USDC in circulation is backed by cash and short-term government treasuries. It's the safest asset class we can get. And so the idea of becoming a bank is about all of the other economic activities that we can support as a bank. But I do not think a one-size-fits-all approach is appropriate to continue promoting innovation. So that, that is the policy issue that we now face in the US and in Congress and in the Senate and elsewhere around what does the future of money look like in, in these new form factors. All right, Josh. Yeah, I mean, two, two things, and I agree with a lot of what Dante said. You know, the first is on this insurance issue, you know, we, we heard from speakers earlier this week on an event we did, there's a real risk about importing some of the, um, what we would say, you know, who cannot qualify, unlike the circles of the world, some of this instability into the FDIC and others. And that's a real risk with some of the things that were recommended by the PWG. But the second thing is, what are we asking these companies to be? And what does it mean from a banking perspective? We have a fractional reserve lending system that basically undermines and basically fuels our economy. So I just, it's a really important question of what we are expecting of these companies through regulation, because if it's about private services, service payment providers, or it's about lending, those are two very different things. And we don't require traditional banks to have one-to-one -one liquidity. That's how the fractional reserve system works. So I think there are real questions raised. And that's why I think the bank terminology itself is not as useful as to what sort of stability, insurance, yes, Candice, to your point, liquidity are we expecting from these institutions? And on that very topic, I mean, what a world we're living in. Yesterday, we announced an initiative called Circle Impact, in which we will begin allocating what we hope is billions of dollars of USDC reserves into the US banking system, specifically into minority depository institutions and into community banks. We think that's a pathway of strengthening the balance sheets and therefore strengthening the communities those banks serve. But also it is a very blockchain based approach to thinking about distribution, thinking about the share of risk and thinking about how we can allocate capital governance and sort of opportunity much more equitably. For the future of money and payments to be more equitable than the past, we need to approach this in radically different ways. One other small indictment I have of some of the president's working group's recommendations is that, and this is happening similarly at the international level with the principles of financial market infrastructure that I'm sure we'll touch upon briefly, is that they're trying to back these technologies into closed proprietary systems. We are introducing competition collectively against the walled garden problem we have in payments. How useful would your email be if you could only send an email to a Yahoo user and not a Gmail and Hotmail user? A lot of the core of innovations with public blockchains on how value is transferred is a protocol for an open internet of value. All of us collectively, whether it's a CBDC or a stablecoin, should continue fighting for that more open version of the future. Yeah, and I think we talked about this a little bit before when we when we all met that uh, we don't have a, a representative of a stablecoin that is algorithmic or like introduces those other um, issues with respect to stability and some of the things that we're all talking about. Um, but next time we'll bring that to the table. All right, but we're on to the last prompt already. Um, and I don't need a lot of intro for this one. And this one, I'm going to give you each two minutes to address. And we're going to go in order, Alex, Simon, Dante, Josh, just so you know. Um, and the question is, can and should stablecoins and CBDCs coexist? So Alex? Yes, they can. I mean, this is a technology that is designed to create and foster interoperability. Now, should they, if we end up in a, in a run rate CBDC world, my, my view is that we sort of take off some of the like crazy potential exponential upside associated with the blockchain world. This idea of you know, cryptopia where everything's on chain, we no longer have fiat currencies, everything is um, you entirely machine speed. And, and maybe that's completely unrealistic regardless. I think CBDCs and, and to a certain extent, stable coins are, are wonderful bridge technologies to allow us to you know, use our existing financial models, use our existing uh, way of understanding the world and, and move towards that, that potentially entirely inclusive machine speed world that, that has no frictions that, that I described a minute ago. Now, I, I think CBDCs, and, and I'll, I'll sort of sum it up with saying they have a very high floor of what they can use as the as the um, as the result of, of implementing blockchain technology, but I think they have a very low ceiling as well. It's going to be an evolution of our current model, which is fine. It's great. Everything that's an evolution is okay. But if you think about it, it's like a, a discounted cash flow valuation instead of an option valuation. 
you're taking out some of the wonder by having it be basically a replication of our existing system. And maybe it won't be, but if you look at a ton of the technology innovations over time, where they get captured and where they end up within structures is incredibly predictive of, of what, the ultimate, um, what the ultimate impact of, of that, that technology is. So back to my initial point of, unless we evolve the structures by which we are using these technologies, and implementation of CBDCs will end up with an evolution of our current structure instead of a revolution that is possible and on the table by a complete deployment of open blockchains. All right, Simon, two minutes or a little less. <laughs> I like it, Alex. Um, yeah, look, I, I think uh, one of the things that I bring up in my discussions with central banks is the need for them to recognize the innovation that's happened in the open source community and in crypto and stable coins over the last decade. And for that to inform their decisions, not just around technology and feature sets, but also around configuration and policy. Um, now, to some that may seem incompatible, you're talking about permissionless decentralized structures. Um, however, these ultimately translate into features and use cases and assurances um, that have been accepted by the growing crypto user base. So again, I think it's super important that central banks in their consideration of CBDCs uh, look at and study what's happened in crypto and not just as some obscure um, anarchistic or you know shadowy super coder innovation uh, but rather as a groundbreaking open source movement the likes of which brought us linux and many other open source developments so incredibly important infrastructure from the open source community this is a similar uh if not more important um contribution to societal infrastructure. So uh, to bring us back to the prompt, yes, I, I do think that they can coexist. It'll be interesting to see where the lines are drawn and how far CBDCs reach as far as use cases go versus where stable coins uh, fill in for those use cases or, or vice versa. Uh, and certainly stable coins have a massive lead um, in terms of pushing innovation, pushing, you know, increased adoption and, and users. Um, very, very excited to be a part of of, uh, of it on both sides and and definitely see the need for for the standards work and so josh i think i'll be in touch with you on that <laughs> but uh, yeah thanks candace yep uh dante so i don't want central banks um competing in this manner any more than i would want the faa building aircraft engines and flying planes i do think however there is a role and a massively important one in which the designated airspace and the designated safe con conduct and the safe sort of operators around innovation on how money moves should continue. For the future of money and payments passes prologue, Visa, MasterCard, ACH, international wire transfers, all of these networks are the sum of the parts of private sector innovation and private sector activity. The second big tech said it could start to innovate at scale, the central banks got agitated and started to compete. The second we started to see the geopolitical stakes raising and then the question of should the West try to out China China with its own digital currency uh, directly issued by central banks, we started to debate what were the merits, what were the risks, what were the opportunities. On that very subject, I've submitted evidence to the UK Parliament on the to CBDC or not to CBDC question. It is an important policy debate. But my argument is our best chance at competing for a more inclusive, more equitable global financial system is to continue to allow this wave of open source infrastructure that supports privacy preservation, the movement of value, the ownership of assets, and pulling stranded assets off the sidelines all over the world has to continue at scale. No single country can do this alone any more than no single private sector actor or stakeholders could do it alone. And this is what we love at Circle about the idea of being a part of an ecosystem. So I don't think we win this debate unless we figure out how to really continue deeply collaborating. Great. All right, Josh, you get the final word. You will be the last I, to speak and then you'll be the last to speak. That's, I appreciate <laughs> that opportunity. Um, I agree with Dante on the collaboration, but I don't agree on the FAA analogy. Money is not an airplane, it's not a cell phone, it's not even the internet, it's sovereignty, it's fiat currency, it's part of what makes a country a country. And so to ask a central bank to remove itself from the process of the innovation that's happening in that space 
as we see behind us, is simply unrealistic to what's happening around the world. For better or worse, the central banks have made up their mind and many of them want to do this. So the better question is about how to shape it safely. And I do believe that we can do these things together. And the truth is, and I don't know if everyone here will agree with it, I think CBDCs need stable coins and I think stable coins need CBDCs. And the reason for that is that central banks do not want to be in the massive retail game. China aside, the Federal Reserve does not want to have 300 million customers it's dealing with. Retail CBD, retail stable coins can play a huge role in this space, but there are core things, core government things that will retain a role for CBDC and the standard setting ability, the transparency, the privacy that a CBDC can set from the Fed, from the European Central Bank, from the Bank of England, from the Bank of Japan can influence the entire world. So we can't remove ourselves from that playing field. It can be a stabilizing force. It can be a force that brings more people into the entire digital currency ecosystem from public to private money. And so that's the idea I'll leave everyone with. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think um, I, I don't know if the folks out there listening are picking winners or not, but uh, to me, we at the Stellar Development Foundation are winners because we get to work with all of you and have these conversations. I um, My other big takeaway from this is that uh, while the debate style is really fun, and this was really great to mix it up a little bit, let's do a podcast next time with no time limits. Um, so thank you, each and every one of you, Josh, Dante, Simon, Alex. This was so great. And uh, more to come. We got to keep talking about these issues. So I will pass it back to you, Justin. Mm-hmm.